Hello people, I am back to catch up on some of the best stuff that's out there in 2011 so far. Stuff that I want people to see, which is why I'm disappointed in myself for lack of videos. But once April, April ends, I will have a lot more time on my hands and that should, at that point, there should be a lot more videos. But I am here now to do some recommending, so let's get started with the Noah show from the 5th of March, which a lot of people have already seen, Great Voyage in Tokyo. The first thing to know about this show is Akiyama Jun. It is performances such as the one he had on this show that is leading many people, myself included, to call him the best wrestler so far in 2011. And why is that? Well, on every big Noah show so far this year, his performance has been to a very good standard, to at least a very good standard. The one thing he's missing, and this is a big thing, is some great performances, you know, but I'm very optimistic that we're going to get some of those because he is one of the few Noah performers out there right now that actually has a recurring theme occurring in his matches. Akiyama is the fading veteran. He's giving um, so much offense to all of these guys who you would not expect to get it, and it's working out extremely well. Uh, example, case in point, here against Yoshia. Um, the match is very good because Yoshia is able to get so much offense in on Akiyama, and you know, Yoshia is a guy who wanders through Noah with little or no direction a lot of the time, but this match showed that he can perform when he's in there with a focused performer, and Akiyama is the most focused performer on the Noah roster so far this year. He's going to compete, or is he in the process, process of competing, I'm not sure of the dates, in All Japan's Champions Carnival, which is their big annual tournament similar to New Japan's G1 Climax. Now, think about what a great story that would be. Akiyama, the guy who was always below Mizawa, Kobashi, Kawada and Tawei in All Japan in the 1990s, goes back to All Japan in 2011 and wins the Champions Carnival, then goes on to win the Triple Crown, something he never won in the 1990s, that's a great story right there, you know, that would be something to um, remember this year for, and I'm hoping that it does happen, so I would say keep your eyes and your your instruments of reading results, I guess, out for um, that, because it might just happen. Um, okay, next is kind of an important thing. I want to make an example out of another match on this Noah show to highlight a clear difference as I see it that would be um, that is notable in the match I'm about to talk about and that is Suzuki Kotaro versus um, Nakajima Katsuhiko uh, my current match of the year um, you can look at the, my match of the year countdown on my page um, this match I want to kind of explain what I saw in this match and others what others saw in this match that makes it in fact very different from a match like Suzuki versus Edwards which I did not like very much to be honest and here's why. Suzuki versus Edwards to me was a 15 minute match that went 30 minutes for absolutely no good reason. That's never good. Um, if you want to go out there without a clear direction and just go back and forth, you should not be going 30 minutes. It just it just never works out well. Um, and this would have been an awesome 15 minute match. I'm just saying it right now. And I know that because the last 10 minutes of that match were awesome, but the first 20 accomplished nothing except time killing. So. That's how I felt about Suzuki versus Edwards. Now to Suzuki versus Nakajima. What I saw in this match was a Nakajima control segment that carried up until a Suzuki comeback that was absolutely stopped in its tracks by an absolutely amazing kick from Nakajima. That's the value in making spots mean something. That's why this match is better. That's only one example of a match that had a lot of those elements that made it work for me, you know? And that's something like that's something that that is something to behold because in general Suzuki Kataro does nothing for me. So um, it is impressive that he was able to it was mostly Nakajima I think that was um, making this one interesting because there's a there's a pretty pitiful control segment from Suzuki in here, but the match is very, very good. Um, I actually do, I actually do think it goes on about five minutes longer than it should have, but that doesn't ruin anything compared when you think about the amazing stuff that they did in the middle portion of the match. I know Daniel actually thinks this was actually better than any match that happened in 2010. I don't think I I would think I don't think I would necessarily say that, but it is damn good. So I'm sure everyone who um, has heard about that match has already seen it. So I'm just kind of sh um, showing what I see as the clear difference between this match 
and a match that might seem similar but in fact is very different. So, and then we get the main event of that show, Segura defending against Giant Bernard. Um, I know some people don't like this match because having a story is no good unless you execute it well. But I think I appreciate the fact that Bernard had more of an arrogant edge to his heel persona. And we haven't seen that we hadn't seen that before against Segura. You know, Takeyama and Morishima were just brute monsters. And to a lesser extent, so were Bison and Murdoch. I did not like the Murdoch match that much, by the way. Um, so Mur so Bernard showed plenty of arrogance. And it shined through in his moves as well. I mean, when Segura goes for the German, Bernard does not counter it. He just uses his weight to stop the move in his tracks. There's a lot of stuff like that going on that kind of um, I reacted well to. It's a very simple match, and that works for the most part. The only time that it kind of hurts the overall reaction to the match was the fact that the finish was very ordinary as well. Sometimes you kind of need to break... Um, out of, of a simplistic formula when it comes to the finish, especially when you consider the kind of onslaught that Segura has had to come back from in the past. This one just kind of felt very ordinary. But I do like the match. It's not making a top 10 or anything, but it kind of hovers at that very good to great level um, on, the Mel on the Meltzer scale. And I say the Meltzer scale because I'm kind of straddling between two scales, scales at the moment. The scale that Progress.tv wants me to use, and the scale that I know will be most recognizable to the people on here. If you want, to, if you want to know what the hell I was talking about there, go over to Progress.tv and look it up. Is all I'll say. Now I want to move on to Zero One's tenth anniversary show, which took place on March sixth. Uh, you know, the show itself wasn't all that much. It started out very strong, but there was too much filler in the middle. But there is one match I want to highlight, though, and that is Hidaka Ikuto versus Ito Takafumi. Have never seen Ito before this, but my Google search tells me that he's primarily an MMA guy. But he wrestled Hidaka on this show, and the match is so strange and bizarre, but it actually is very interesting. I gave it very high praise because it kept my interest the whole time. It had a very unique feel to it, and that's mostly because of Ito. Um, Ito was awkward. Hard to move and completely uncooperative. And to begin with, he's selling Hidaka's offense with almost a pleasure to him. Like he's enjoying it almost. Um, but then Hidaka, Hidaka gets aggressive and the match gets very violent. Ito, for all his individuality, you would never doubt that Ito was not taking it seriously because he definitely does. And that's reflected in the finish stretch, which is really, really good. And the match is great is all I'll say. It's, I guarantee not everyone will like it. But if you like something a little different, you will at least be intrigued by it. It's a very bizarre match, but uh, I reacted well to it. I thought it was um, very good. It actually it did have some sensible stuff in it. It wasn't just a complete breaking of all the rules we know in pro wrestling. But it does have some very good qualities to it. And I was very intrigued by some of the strange stuff that happened within it. So I would say highly recommended for that. Um, I will be returning to something that happened on the Zero One show in a, later on in the video, but I, w I do want to touch first on the All Japan show that happened on the 21st of March and the great tag match that happened on it. And it was Big Japan versus All Japan, Sekimoto Daisuke and Okabayashi Yuji versus Sanada Seiya and Soya Manabu. These guys had two matches before this. One happened in All Japan in February, which I thought was very good, but not really worthy of high recommendation. There were some people who did think it was that good, but uh, I did not. But you can look it up if you um, are curious about it. And there was a second match at some point. I can't go into details because I didn't see it. And I've read no one who watched it that thought it was anything worth seeing. So I did not see it. But this match, however, was great. This match is for the All Asia Tag Team Championships. These guys had more time in this match than in the first match, and they actually had a better sense of direction in this match as well, which is a credit to them. What holds this match back for a while is some, what I would say, overly friendly exchanges. That's, that's, that's something that you never want, but the near falls kind of made it more about competitive drive and less about interpromotional hate. Uh, and then they packed all sorts of supremely unfriendly stuff into the finishing stretch you know can't say any more about it it was quite a quite a good match i would say um quite a great match actually currently number two on my match of the year countdown and 
I'd say, once again, a highly recommended uh, match to check out. Okay, before I move away from the Japanese stuff uh, into some very, very good German stuff, yes, I want to talk about someone who could be very special to pro rest if everything works out well. That person is Hashimoto Daichi. Um, for those unfamiliar, let me explain. Um, once upon a time, you had Hashimoto Shinya. He was one of the biggest stars in New Japan Pro Wrestling in the 90s. Um, and was also the original founder of the Zero One promotion. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2005. And Zero One has been fading since then. Fading away into the glorified independent promotion that we know it as today. Um, Hashimoto Daichi is his son. And is just breaking into the world of professional wrestling. He wrestled his first matches in March this year against his uncles. Um, Chono Masahiro and Muto Keiji. This guy is very important to everyone who wants to see real emotion return to professional wrestling. Because people care about the name Hashimoto in Japan. And if Daichi works out as a talent, he could be the next big draw in Japan. You know, I mean, these matches, I'm not going to say that they show beyond a shadow of a doubt that he will improve as time goes on. You know, he's not an instant prodigy or anything. But he did what he had to do in his first matches, and he certainly didn't embarrass himself. I'd say keep an eye on him, you know, because the fact that they put him against Chono and Muto straight up showed that they really want to make something of this guy. So he is definitely someone to watch. He's definitely someone to watch how they use him as time goes on. Um, if he's obviously, it's not just his own talent. If he is um, pushed out there before he's ready, then it will ruin any chance he has of being that guy. But they know what they have to do, I think, and I think I hope they will, you know, execute it well and lead him to t towards great things. So that is um, what I want to say about recent Japanese stuff. I want to close with some stuff that I would normally talk about. It's a promotion that I had never watched before um, the last number of hours. Um, the matches were highly recommended, and I checked them out. The show happened in Germany and was... Westside Extreme Wrestling, WXW, 16 Karat Gold, 2011 Tournament. Three nights of wrestling featuring stars from the US, Europe, and Japan. And, you know, some people thought there were just so many great matches on this show, uh, on these on this set of shows. My number of great, well, not really great, but my number of recommended matches on the show is close to four. Um, two of them really aren't a huge deal. You know, you had Shiozaki versus Suzuki and Sekimoto versus El Generico. The latter was kind of... I expect a lot when I hear Sekimoto versus El Generico. It was kind of disappointing, I'd say, but the finish of that match is really, really good, I would say. Definitely um, worth watching just to see some of those power spots at the end. It was really, really good. Um, but there are two matches that I think deserve attention. The first one is going to freak some of you out because this is me talking. But it's Davey Richards versus Zack Sabre Jr. from day two of the tournament. What makes this different from other indie style matches? The difference here is Zack Sabre Jr. The guy takes a beating from Davey, sells it like a dream, and does that all the way up from the finish. Consistency. And he always makes you care about Davey's high impact moves in a way that other guys do not. You know, his striking is poor at some points, but he brings enough emotion to them to make you overlook his technique. Davey is pretty ordinary in a lot of respects in the match, but he does time some of the more important moves well, and they are important because they are timed well. Like the Shooting Star Press, for example, pretty well done, and some of the Lariats as well. Um, the match has some overkill in it that I didn't particularly enjoy, but, and I guarantee you there'll be people who, there'll be people who will like this a lot more than I did, but this is still a great match because they made you care. That's all I'll say. Um, Sabre was undoubtedly um, put on a very, very good, two great individual performance that made this worth watching. Sabre is a guy who will be facing Kenta at one of the UK NOAA shows. And if Sabre brings this kind of performance against a, guy, against a guy like Kenta, who I consider to be better than Davey Richards in most aspects of pro wrestling, then the match could be something special. I'm looking forward to it now. So... Definitely um, worth watching there. Second match that deserves highlighting is the final of the tournament. That is Sammy Callahan versus Big Van Walter. You know, Walter's a big guy. He's a big Austrian guy. He can be very robotic in some of his mannerisms. He needs to go to Japan where he can polish his skills against some of the better heavyweights there. But 
In this match, he looks a lot better than he actually is because he's in the ring with someone like Sammy Callahan. Because, you know, Callahan will sell his offense and then he'll go into a comeback that will not make Walter look stupid. Um, Callahan's idea of a comeback is not your typical babyface, energetic, high performance. Um, it's got a very dark feel to it, but it's good because it's different. You know, I'd probably put this match just slightly ahead of the Davy Sabre match. I'll probably be one of the few guys who do, who do that. And speaking of, you know, something that people will like more than I will, um, there's a tag match on day three of the tournament. Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly versus leaders of the new school. The match is almost completely spotty and didn't have the great individual performance that made Davy and Sabre work for me. But there will be definitely some people, and I've seen some people, who will really love the match. So I would say check that out as well. Um, people will need links unless they're going to go to SmartMark Video and buy the DVDs, which would be nice. But if people need links, just send me a personal message. Um, that's me finished talking for now. I hope it will not take me a month, to do, a month to do another video. If it does, then the next thing I'll be talking about is the previews for the UK Noah shows. But I do think I'll be back on here before that. After April ends, I will have more time. So I will talk to you all later.